Okay, so now we have Sam who's going to talk to us about building Flatpak apps with BuildStream. Um. Hello, yes. Um, so this is an open talk. For those of you that don't um, know about open talks, tomorrow there will be more open talk slots. You can propose talks by going to reception, writing on a post-it note what you want to talk about and sticking it on the board, which is near the registration desk. And then you can do your own talk. Um, so if you find this one boring, do a better one. <laughs> it's in your hands. What I'm going to talk about is how to build a flat pack application using BuildStream. Um, so does everyone know what BuildStream is, at least basically? Hands up. Yeah, who knows? Who's heard of it? So it's a build tool. You can build stuff with it. Um, who's built a flat pack application? Not enough people. More people should be building flat pack applications. Um, to do it, normally you'd use Flatpak Builder, and actually, my advice would be continue to use Flatpak Builder. It's the tool for the job. Um, you can use FlatHub, which is this really cool website where you can have your Flatpak built as a service, and you don't have to do anything except write a JSON file, and it publishes it for you. If you use BuildStream, you don't get any of that. Um, there's also some workflow tools like Flatpak Dev CLI, which is um, a helper that lets you kind of run your app from your source tree, but in the Flatpak environment. Again, you can't use that with BuildStream. So why would you do it? Uh, one thing is simply as a proof that there's more than one way to build a flat pack. I mean, there's more than one C compiler in the world, and that's a good thing. There's, there should be more than one way to produce a flat pack application. Um, it's being used to build the SDKs already. Maybe you saw Adam's talk this morning about building the free desktop SDK. That's being built with BuildStream. You can build apps using the same tool. And actually, the initial support for building Flatpak applications came from that project. It's the same plugin that builds the SDKs that can be used to build apps. Um, it's more scalable. Flatpak Builder is designed for a kind of specific use case. It, does, it doesn't support distributing builds across multiple machines or anything like that. So the use case I can really see for BuildStream in future for building Flatpak apps is if some big organization wants to produce something. Let's take Spotify as an example. Not a realistic example, maybe. But as an example, Spotify produce a Windows installer, a Mac OS bundle. Um, maybe in the future, they'll produce their own flat pack. Maybe they want to produce a Snap. A tool like BuildStream could produce all of those things from the same project, where Flat Pack Builder is designed for the specific case of just building flat packs. All right, so the details of how to do it. Um, there's some examples. The first two are, I don't want to say toys, but proof of concepts. Uh, the third one is an app that I've been developing, and I decided to use BuildStream instead of Flatpak Builder to build it. And it's practical. It's less practical than using Flatpak Builder, but it works. Uh, so if you want to see how to do it, there's quite a lot of, um, let's say, boilerplate involved. You have to right, um, I don't remember how many files there are. There's maybe 30 or 40 files involved defining the project. So you'll want to base it on a specific example. Um, you have, I was going to show the project a little bit on GitLab, but I realized that my laptop doesn't have a HDMI port, so that's going to be a bit tricky. You'll just have to imagine that you're looking at a, a tour of the repo from this uh, skeletal description. So you have a configuration file. You have BuildStream builds these elements. An element basically corresponds to a project. Like, for example, you'll have an element to import the SDK. Uh, you'll have an element to build your application. You'll have an element to build any of your dependencies that aren't in the SDK. And you'll have an element that defines the flat pack bundle that comes out the other end. And that last element has the metadata that says what your app can do. That's where you put the metadata to say, I need access to the home directory, for example. I need access to the camera. And then finally, there's a shell script in there which does a few, let's call them hacks, to make it actually deploy to Flatpak. Uh, the workflow I found, the first build is very slow because it has to download a whole bunch of SDKs from an OS tree repo. In general, though, I found that the tool takes about 30 seconds. 
from pushing a change to the application to running the flat pack as a result, which is okay. Um, to be honest, it's a bit slow for me, and I came up with a hack to run the application from the source tree, which reduces the cycle time to about one second. But that way, you can't test in a real flat pack environment. So I say it takes about 30 seconds on an average, maybe slightly old machine, to go from committing a change to testing it in the real environment. And it takes about seven gigabytes of disk space, which is something to be aware of. I haven't compared that with Flatpak Builder, probably about the same. Um, so here's a slightly cropped, I don't know why LibreOffice decided to crop my screenshot, but there's a, a screenshot to show that you can build your application in GitLab CI. Everyone hopefully is using GitLab CI now, right? Who's using GitLab CI? Excellent, 100 points. Um, if, have you anyone tried to build a flat pack app in GitLab CI yet? Yeah? Yeah, I did. Uh, I said that most of the non core apps have a flat, uh, flat pack app generated by CI. Yeah. Uh, have you found any issues with caching? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. So the problem here is that GitLab CI allows you to cache any kind of intermediate data to speed up subsequent builds. Um, so for example, you've built a load of source code, you want to cache the source code to save downloading it again, uh, and ideally you want to cache what you've built in case you can reuse it. And the problem here is that both Flatpak Builder and Buildstream use OS tree. OS tree requ requires file system extended attributes in order to uh, function, basically. And GitLab CI's caching mechanism stuffs all of the data into a zip file, discards the extended attributes, and then on the next build, unpacks that file without the extended attributes, which leads to OS tree breaking in kind of curious and confusing ways. So that's not good. Um, uh, there's not too many ways around this, really. Um, what you can do with Buildstream, what I've been doing, is using GitLab CI caching for the sources, so that's maybe one or two gigabytes of data, and then setting up a Buildstream artifact cache to cache the build results. Um, so that's basically a way of caching binaries, and it involves setting up a service on a server that you control, so it's a little bit involved and maybe costs you $10 a month for a VPS, um, I don't think anything's providing this as a free service yet. But it can save a lot of build time, so it's worth doing. Um, also, there's some bug in Buildstream which prevents pushes from working at the moment. So I can't give you any timings on how fast that is, but I'm assuming it's going to be really fast. Uh, what else? So testing. What you want to do when you have a flat pack application is run your tests inside the same bundle environment that the application runs in, right? Because you have all your dependencies in there. And when you're using Flatpak Builder, there's a command line argument that lets you run the build to a certain point and then open a shell inside what it's built, and you can run the tests there. The parallel in Buildstream is that it has a BST shell command where you open a shell in the, a checked out artifact. Uh, and it has a kind of read-only rootfs, and then you can write to certain directories. And you can set up a kind of similar sandbox environment. So it's great for running unit tests. And something I found really useful is you can actually create a new element and have test-only dependencies. So for example, my application depends on PyTest, which isn't in the Flatpak SDK. It isn't a dependency of the application, it's just a dependency of the test suite. So it can go in a test environment, build stream element, and be built in CI, but then not be included quite easily in the final application bundle. And once you have this test environment set up, you can mount your application source tree from your home directory in there, and you can run the application from its source tree. It requires a few kind of hacks, setting your G setting schema path to point to the build tree and uh, various other kind of messy things. But on the other hand, it saves you loads of time and it allows you to debug by adding print statements, which is the best way of debugging, I've always found. Um, finally, you'll want to publish your app when you can't use FlatHub because it's built around the idea of running Flatpak Builder as a service. So you lose on that front. Um, I think that deploying an app 
is pretty straightforward. You just basically set up an OS tree repository on a server that's public and copy the contents of the deployed bundle onto the server. And you have to do something kind of special with AppStream metadata, but this is documented in the Flatpak documentation. Um, so let's say it's left as an exercise to the reader. Uh, and that's, uh, that's my story. So I presume there's still some time left. We can, I don't know, yeah, we can have some questions if anyone's more curious. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. Uh, like uh, currently, in, in, uh, for, the, for the most of the GNOME core apps, we have like we build we use Flatback Builder in the CI. Yeah. And we also run the test suite in the CI, but that's like a really hacky uh, thing because we like we need to override the the manifest uh, to point to the local checkout. Uh, would BuildStream make it that easier and have a more straightforward CI setup? Uh, uh, in terms of when you have, um, so you have a build on GitLab and it says I'm building this yes. branch, my feature branch, and you have to manually edit the manifest to yes, say yes. build this feature branch instead. Actually, no, what I've been doing is using sed to update the build stream project to change <laughs> the ref. So yeah, we <laughs> build, kind of we the, build the modules and then take over with a cell currently. Um, no, it's less of a hack than that. What I've been doing is, so a build stream project, each element says, mm -hmm. here's the source, it's this repo, mm -hmm. this ref, and what I've been doing is using sed to change the ref to the one we want to build. Oh. So the downside to this is that GitLab CI checks out the source code of the application, and then BuildStream clones the repo again to yeah. get this other ref. But the upside is it's kind of a one-line change rather mm -hmm. than having to do what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, possibly the same thing would be possible with Flatpak Builder, though, because you could just edit the JSON file. Yeah, but that would be a sad hack because, yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's not like it would be, it won't, it won't be doubling the long term. I mean, the other, it's a difficult, difficult problem to solve, right? Because both build tools want to know where the source code comes from. Yeah. So if you say, hey, build from this random directory on the host, it's giving up a bit of that control. Yeah. Um, so it would be possible to add some kind of way in to do that, but I'm not sure whether the stream will. All right, any other questions? Very good. Everyone knows everything. Perfect. Thanks for listening.